I am Glenn Laurie and I'm with Dr. Carol Swain. I will introduce her in a moment, but I want you to know that I am a professor of economics and of international public affairs at Brown University. Uh, this is the Glenn Show. And uh, uh, the Watson Institute for International Public Affairs sponsors the Glenn Show. So I'm with Carol Swain. Uh, and uh, Carol, I'm just, just excited about being able to interview on my podcast. Thank you well, for coming way on. Back. We go way back. When did we first meet? I think it was in the 80s, right? When you were an assistant professor at Princeton? No, I contacted you when I was a graduate. No, I, I believe I was an undergraduate at Ronald College, and my professor had introduced me to your writings and Thomas Sowell's. Um, maybe I was introduced to the writings, and then I contacted you as a graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long time ago. Me and Thomas Sowell, so I guess it was uh, the Black conservatives that uh, whoever introduced you to us was introducing you to. And Walter Williams, and it was a white Republican a professor who told me- Oh, it was me, William Keach, wasn't it? No, no, it was Bill Hill at Roanoke College in Salem, Virginia. I beg your pardon. And he was a professor of um, public affairs and you know a small school so he taught a lot of things he taught philosophy and various things and he had been um my advisor when i transferred from the community college and i remember uh his telling me that uh telling me not to expect to do as well at the at ronald college as i had done in the past and to me that was like throwing the gauntlet down and so I signed up for his classes, even though all the black students told me he was a racist and that um, I should avoid him. And they gave me a list of all the racist professors and he was on it. And so my pattern was whenever I was told to avoid a professor, I took their courses and tried to you know, impress them by doing my best. And I ended up getting a B plus in the first class I took with him. And then after that, I got all A's. <laughs> okay, so he was telling you that there was going to be no uh, affirmative action, no favoritism. This was going to be tough, and you rose to the challenge and, and went ahead and excelled anyway. Well, I mean, he was just preparing me uh, for Ronald College because it was a private Lutheran school, and he was telling me that with my community college and high school dropout background that I shouldn't expect to do as well as I'd done in the past. So. He was sincerely trying to prepare me for what I would encounter. And the very first paper that I wrote in, in as an undergraduate was on affirmative action. I think I still have a copy of it. Well, you're lucky if you st still have your papers from all those years ago. Well, I gotta, uh, you, you went on to Virginia Tech and, and then to uh, UNC, is that correct? Yes, and I never uh, sought to get a um, PhD. Like I had transferred from the community college where I studied uh, business. Uh, initially, I was interested in art. I have a lot of art talent, so I wanted to be a commercial artist. And I was told to be practical. And I was always a person who mentored well. Whenever people told me what I needed to do to be successful, I would find the best person I could identify in that field, and then I would do whatever advice they gave me. But they told me uh, not to do to take um, that I needed to take something other than art, so I chose business merchandising. So I have a degree in business, one in criminal justice, two in political science, and then a master's in law from Yale that I earned after I finished my uh, PhD and been a professor for about ten years. You did a PhD in political science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And your first job after that was at Princeton as an assistant professor of politics? Yes. In fact, I've only had two jobs in academia, Princeton and Vanderbilt. You ended up with tenure at Princeton as a tenured associate professor, and you published a pathbreaking book, Black Faces, Black Interest. Yes, and I have to tell you that I got early tenure. And when I was hired, I told them that I was going to get early tenure. And John D John Diulio. Yes. was head of my search committee. And he had achieved tenure in one year. And I thought if he did it in one year, I could certainly do it in three. And so uh, by the third year at Princeton, I had outside offers 
of tenure. And so I used that to negotiate early tenure. So instead of seven years, I did it in three. Went up in the third year, got it in fourth. This is the highest level of academic uh, political science in the country, indeed, uh, in the world. And uh, you were a superstar at a very young age. What was the argument of Black Faces, Black Interests? Well, during the time I was in graduate school, 1980s, uh, there was this argument that only Blacks could represent Black interests. And uh, Black Faces, Black Interests started out as a dissertation because I asked, you know, is this true that only Blacks can represent Black interests? And so as part of that uh, study, and that's, that is when I contacted you, because I had to uh, define, I had to come up with an indicator for Black interests. And so you were very helpful, uh, with helping me think that through. And I concluded that political party was more important than the race of the representative, and that as long as Blacks held the views they did, they'd best be represented by Democrats. Consequently, it didn't make sense to draw majority Black districts. And what was pathbreaking about the book is that I identified the trade-off between Black faces, having more Black faces in office, and Black interests. You could have more Black people and have less representation of your policy goals. I was also in the forefront of making the argument that whites would support black candidates, and when black candidates lost, it wasn't because of their race, uh, that they were losing because of their views, that they were so liberal. And the book caught a lot of people's attention. It was published in 1993 and updated in 1995 because I had a chapter that discussed what would happen if uh, Democrats lost control of the Congress. And so I yeah. painted a picture of what actually happened a year after. And people had never anticipated because Democrats had controlled the Congress for um, over 40 years. And so no one thought it could happen, but my book <laughs> painted this picture of it could happen and that drawing the majority black districts was not a way to increase uh, black representation, that that was a trade-off that they were making. I wanna try something on you, see how you react to it, because Stacey Abrams' name is very much in the news these days. Uh, this is the woman who narrowly lost in a gubernatorial uh, campaign in Georgia uh, and uh, who is on the short list to become the vice president, uh, Biden's uh, running mate. For the <laughs> <laughs> anyway, who, who um, lost to, is it Brian Kemp? Is that the guy's name? Yes. Uh, in Georgia and uh, refused to concede the election uh, on uh, voter suppression arguments. And here's the, here's the provocative proposition I want to put in front of you, Professor Swain, it is this. Uh, if Stacey Abrams had been pro-life, she'd be governor of Georgia right now, okay? So therefore, therefore, if all of the people who are hollering about black people not getting a voice want to have a voice in the South, all they have to do is untether themselves from the left wing of the Democratic Party and reflect the historically resonant moral position of black people who are largely a reverent Christian people by standing up for values that are not inconsistent with the interests of blacks, but rather are an authentic expression of those interests. She'd be governor of Georgia right now. So while she's running around blaming racists for blocking black people from getting to the ballot block, she's the one who's not representing black people. Well, I mean, you could uh, argue that's the entire civil rights leadership. Uh, back, you know, in the day, the early days, Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton were pro-life. And you think about uh, the millions of black babies that have been aborted over the decades, they would be voters now. We would be the largest minority um, in the country as opposed to the, the Hispanics today because we have killed off so many, you know, potential black voters. And so that is very problematic. And it seems that with black women, so many of them have been captured by white liberal feminist politics. And it's not in the interest of blacks. And I think that black men, more of them are woke as to what is happening. And as a consequence, President Trump or candidate Trump in 2016 got more of the votes of black men than black women. Black women, you know, they are really deceived. 
they're working against their own self-interest. Okay, now we're way out there and a lot of people are gonna say this is far right crazy talk, but I wanna persist uh, for a moment. I mean, on a number of things, you just invoke the personhood of the unborn babies uh, who are aborted by African-American women exercising their quote unquote right to choose. You just invoke that. You put that in the context of- right, A right to choose in the sense that they are, are just trapped in, in so many ways with the abortion clinics uh, in their communities and the black leaders pushing that it's okay and the church being silent. And so um, they are deceived and it's detrimental to the population. And if the, Demo if the Republicans were doing to black people what the Democrats are doing, we would call it genocide because it is genocidal. You just called abortion black voter suppression. That's what you just did, Carol. <laughs> and, and, and here's the thing that I find most provocative about this, and, and I'm not unsympathetic to your position. I'm just gonna say that. I know people get angry, but I, I'm not concerned about that, Ronnie. Here's the thing that I find most interesting about it. The question on the table is what are black interests? What are actually black interests? Pardon? <laughs> to be alive, to make a living, you know, to, to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's no, no, but they're going to talk about the autonomy. There's going to be a pro-choice argument here. They're going to talk about the woman's autonomy, about her freedom from being uh, told what to do with her body. And they're going to say that black women would have been burdened with the consequences of uh, a pro-life position uh, that uh, would, in, in uh, fundamental ways, uh, violate the, the rights of women to be in control of what happens to their bodies. Glenn, aren't you glad that our mothers uh, didn't look at uh, whether or not we would be a burden when they found themselves pregnant with us? Yes. I'm one of 12 children. My mother didn't abort any of her children. And um, I'm the only one that made it, you know, into the middle class and had a, a, a profession. But the rest of them, you know, they do okay. Uh, and so I think if you were to interview any of them, they would not say it would have been better off if our mother had exercised her right to choose and had eliminated some of us. Do you agree with my supposition that Stacey Abrams would be governor of Georgia right now if she had come out pro-life? Well, if she were pro-life, she'd be a Republican, and so she would probably be governor. <laughs> <laughs> A Republican like you. Christian, and I would have been out there working for her. <laughs> I mean, campaigning for her, you know. Making a born-again Christian like you. Values. A born-again Christian. Do you ever uh, give your testimony, uh, Carol, about what, what happened in your life, how you met Jesus? I have, and you know, I had a late conversion. It was after I earned my tenure at Princeton, and I was a single-minded seeker of tenure. That was my entire focus. And then after I had uh, the tenure, I was so disillusioned that I had, you know, that this was all there was to it. And so for me, after I got tenure, I became depressed. And there was this downward spiral that sent me uh, seeking re you know, a religious solution, I guess. And so it took me through New Age, Eastern religions, uh, I went all kinds of places before I ended up having an experience in a medical hospital um, that um, I share sometimes, but that was the beginning of um, my conversion. And this was a hospital in Princeton where I thought I was dying. It was like my life was being played out in front of me and I was sure I was dying. Of course I didn't, but there was a black Kent Pentecostal chaplain at that hospital, which is odd. Princeton is not the kind of community that would have a black Pentecostal chaplain at the hospital that everyone used, but he was there and there was a cleaning lady that threw a, threw a book in my bed about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Little thin book about Jesus. And um, that was the beginning, but it took a few years for me to really know what it meant to be a Christian. And so in 1999, and this was after I had accepted the job at Vanderbilt, but before I actually showed up, I went to New Haven to uh, get that fifth degree uh, in law. And that very first uh, week, I asked someone, you know, to recommend a church because I felt like at that point, I was not a, a churchgoer, or, but I was more spiritual. 
I was more spiritual and I thought that I should go to a church and give some money. And I wanted a little inner city church because I knew their needs were great. And so I sat in the back of that church waiting for them to pass the offering. But somehow I, I ended up answering the altar call. And so I was at the altar in tears, you know, that I didn't expect. And I was very confused because I've always been in control and I had a plan for that day. And that plan was to sit in the back of the church when the offering plate came by to put my check in, but somehow I ended up at the altar, you know, sobbing. And so I was very puzzled. Went back the next week, same thing. Third week, a woman came up behind me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, um, God tells me that you need a mother. And while you're in New Haven, I'm gonna be your mother. And at that moment, I knew it was God because I'm second from the oldest of 12 children. And I've always felt like I didn't have a mother even uh -huh. though my mother lives with me now. I've always felt like I didn't have a mother. And um, I was always looking for a mother by hanging out with older women. Always it, uh, Excuse me, was it a black church? Yeah, it was a little black inner city church. And, uh, and I became a regular church goer and the pastor was female. I think the name of it was Faith Temple. Uh, and she kind of took me under her wing. And then I went to a second black church while I was in New Haven. And there um, I became a devout believer in that year that I earned the master's degree in law at Yale. I was active in the black church. And, and when I moved to Nashville, I was literally not the person they hired in 1998. And I told my dean that something had happened in New Haven and I was not the person they hired. And I thought God was gonna call me into the ministry and I was gonna have this life. Um, that did not happen. You know, I ended up uh, publishing a book that I was working on, The New White Nationalism. I want to get to that. Yeah, I want uh, God uh, to bring me from academia. Uh, and I want to, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Well, I'm just telling you, when I came to, to Nashville, when I moved there in 2000, I came as a born again, on fire Christian. And that doesn't mean I proselytized in the classroom. I never did any of that but I kept waiting for God to move me out of academia. And I was very bold in the new white nationalism because I thought that would be my last academic book. It was, um, and that may be true because my other books have been more popular. Carol, Carol, hold on a minute. I, I want to talk about the new white, nas new yeah. white nationalism at length, but I want to, I want to ask you about being a Christian in the academy. Okay. Uh, because that's, um, uh, that's territory that I have some familiar with my um, familiarity with myself from my own personal experience, and it's also in some ways very rare at uh, you know the more sort of uh, rarefied uh, ranks of uh, of academia to see publicly confessing Christians talking ab about their faith, um, and I wonder how uh, it in your case has been received by your colleagues and your students and, and how it's affected your own perception of your work. Uh, I know that you have retired from Vanderbilt now, but you had a long career there, almost 20 years, uh, and you taught also at Princeton. Uh, how is it that this conversion uh, experience of yours uh, affected the way people reacted to you and how it is it that you've affected how you looked at your own, your own work? Well, I can tell you that at uh, Vanderbilt was when I became a public devout Christian, that people knew that I was Christian. And when I told the dean that something happened while I was in New Haven and that I was not the person they hired, that particular dean of the law school said, I would do everything in my power to protect you. And so immediately, you know, I was this person in need of protection. I had assumed that God was gonna move me out of academia and I would not be there that long. I can tell you that I've never won a national prize since then. The outside job offers ended. And uh, I had a Dean tell me that my faith was standing in the way of my career. And I asked him if any students or any colleagues had complained, he complained about me and he said, no. And I knew that I was not proselytizing in the classroom but on the first day of class, when we introduce ourselves to students, I would um, tell them about my background and they would know that I'm Christian because I believe in truth and advertising. I believe, you know, that people need to know who they're in the classroom with during the drop ad period. And, um, and so 
it made things uh, very difficult, but- you, You're saying that uh, you feel that you've been discriminated against because of your faith? <laughs> I'm not gonna publicly say that, uh, but of course I, I, I was treated differently I, I, and job offers ended and people, you know, they look at my distinguished career. I've won the highest prize in the profession that a political scientist can win. It's the career prize, that Woodrow Wilson prize, that if you are a white scholar, if you're a white male, if you are white and you win that prize, you know, it's like the Nobel Prize for political scientists. It didn't do a lot for me because I'm black and maybe it was because of affirmative action and the fact that I'm Christian, but I can say that I won, you know, three national prizes but none from um, academia after I became a Christian. And then with my books that I've written since then, you know, they are not likely to get reviewed. They don't get reviewed in the same way. And so- Those yes, prizes were for- discrimination. Excuse me, I just want to be sure I understand. Those prizes were for Black Faces, Black Interests? The, the three national prizes, but the New White Nationalism, uh, you know, was nominated by the uh, publisher for a Pulitzer Prize. And um, that book did not do as well as it should have done because it didn't get reviewed in the way that uh, Black Faces, Black Interests got reviewed. People accused me of being a sensationalist and um, they just did not like the message of that book. Okay, so what year is that book? 2002. <laughs> All right, now, now why I've read, uh, there's a very nice uh, in-depth uh, uh, profile of your academic work that I saw at the Weekly Standard, which I was very impressed by, because the writers seem to appreciate the significance of these two books. Uh, we've talked about uh, Black Faces, Black Interests. You anticipate and predict something that actually comes to pass within a decade of the publication of your book, which is the rise of this uh, resentment fueled and angry identitarian movement amongst white conservatives or white nationalists. And please correct me if I don't characterize this in, in an appropriate manner. Uh, but what do you observe in the book? What do you see happening and how uh, is it that it uh, is regarded now as having been prescient? Well, I have to tell you that that was the first book I wrote uh, after I had my conversion experience. And I was working on a different book, Glenn, and you're responsible for me uh, switching my focus because I was working on a book on affirmative action. And if you read uh, The New White Nationalism, it has you know maybe 550 pages. It's a long book because I ended up folding my affirmative action research into The New White Nationalism. But my uh, book before I had an encounter with you at a conference, was about uh, when blacks and whites agree fairness and opportunities. And I had done some experimental research that showed if you presented people with concrete situations through vignettes, that whites and blacks would agree on what was fair, even uh, uh, to the point that black people might select a white uh, hypothetical student over a black student if that person had a particular profile. And so I found tremendous agreement between whites and blacks. And I felt like all the division that we were talking about during that time uh, between blacks and whites over race, that that was a, uh, an on affirmative action, that that was part of an artifact of the way we asked the questions, that if you gave people with, with people real situations, that they would uh, agree. So, I mean, I thought that that was significant. And this was during the time that um, Bowen and Bach wrote The Shape of the River and everyone was talking about affirmative action and I was so excited because I had the solution. And, uh, <laughs> and what and, was my objection, Carol? I'm sorry, I don't even remember. I'm gonna get to your objection, but the thing about it is that the world did not receive me in the same way because the elites, they were ready for the message of um, Black Faces, Black Interests. But when it came to the fact that I was uh, arguing against race-based affirmative action and more towards uh, class-based, merit-based affirmative action, it, they were not ready for that. But your objection, you said to me like, so what? Who cares if whites and blacks agree? We have serious problems in this world. Uh, and I can't remember, you know, more. That's all I remember you saying. But I remember myself being deeply wounded and going home and, uh, and then, 
becoming aware of at this point in time, and you may recall this, uh, there were uh, high profile incidents, uh, the instances taking place, incidents taking place of um, people going out and shooting others of, of different race. Whether it was a white going out, you know, killing a bunch of blacks or Jews or a black man that went out and shot white men. All of these, uh, a college student from the University of Illinois that had been recruited to a hate group that went and um, he killed two, two people, he shot at 11. All of that was taking place. And I became very curious about what causes a person to hate to the level that they'd want to take someone's life. And I realized that to get that information, you would have to interview the people. And obviously, I couldn't interview them, you know, for... I could not interview them for obvious reasons because we're talking about white nationalists. I identified 10 for a case study and I used a white researcher with a PhD that was also at Princeton. I started the research. This while is Russ I Neely. Yes. And so he contacted these individuals. Not a single one said no. He told them he was working with a Princeton professor. Not a single one asked, who are you working with? And they signed three releases without asking who he was working with. Uh, and some of those, like um, William Pierce, the guy that wrote uh, the Turner Diaries and um, a book called The Hunter, and he started the National Alliance, he had a policy of not giving interviews to Blacks and Jews. And he was the one that I feared the most. And the year that the book was published and it started getting attention, he died within two months, and boy, was I relieved. <laughs> now, you interviewed Jared Taylor in this uh, as well, did you not? Yeah, and I, I tell you, I have a lot of respect for Jared Taylor, and what I respect about him is his honesty. And um, Now, this is the guy that thinks Black people are genetically inferior in terms of intellect, isn't it? Yes, he, that's, that's the argument he makes. What I find fascinating about Jared Taylor is that he's the child of Christian missionaries, and he was raised in Japan, and there, that's a very ethnocentric uh, community where he was an outsider. And but Carol, as a black woman, how can you have respect for somebody who thinks blacks are genetically inferior? I have respect for people that are willing to make that case, you know, provide whatever data that they can marshal. Uh, and I, my interactions with him have been, you know, very pleasant. Now, he would deny this today. But when I published my book, he called me to compliment me uh, by the fact that I had been, I had fairly presented the case and that he had thought that all blacks hated white people until he encountered me. And as a Christian, and at that point I was a Christian, it meant a lot to me that at least I had opened this man's eyes up to the fact that no, blacks don't hate whites. Uh, some of the issues that he raised, I, to me, he's the most important subject in the whole book because of the fact that he is an intellectual. He um, has a degree from Yale and the London School of Economics. He makes a, a very logical, rational case for his position. And I felt like if I were some white kid from App Appalachia, especially if I were a white male, that I could be persuaded by his arguments. And so I knew he was very dangerous, that he had an argument that would resonate with the wider population. And the issues that I identified in the book, many of those issues are still around. I felt like that if mainstream politicians did not address those issues, that people who had voices that were more extreme, that they would be able to persuade large um, numbers of people you know, to their way of thinking. And with Jared Taylor, he doesn't espouse violence. You know, he uses social science data, FBI uh, statistics, IQ data to make his case. Yeah, I've, I've encountered Jared Taylor. I, I don't say I know him in the sense of interviewed him or had long conversation, but I've encountered him on more than one occasion. Uh, most recently in Washington, D.C. at a conference that the Manhattan Institute sponsored, where after I had made some remarks, he challenged me as to whether or not I was open to entertaining the question of genetic influences on social outcomes. 
Mm -hmm. uh, to which I responded for the record that, yes, of course, I was open. I agreed that that's a very fundamental issue about free expression and inquiry and, uh, you know, what civil society is supposed to be. And you don't get to rule certain questions of fact out of bounds a priori uh, mm -hmm. just because they make you squirm in your seat or they disquiet people. I, I agree with them about that. But I went on to say that I did not agree as a social scientist, that the weight of the evidence was in support of the uh, of the uh, hereditarian uh, point of view as a significant determinant of social inequality. To say that it plays a role around the margins is one thing. To say that it's a significant and constraining factor on uh, what we do is another. That was my position, and I just wanted to put that on on the on the record. But um, the new well, let me tell you about him. So, yeah, go ahead. About him, he uh, argued that. Uh, black people that had an advantage in the sense that they had leaders to speak up for them and that white people needed uh, leaders that would be similar to Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton. And he has spent a lot of time, as you know, focusing on black crime and the fact when there are heinous crimes against white people that they don't get the same type of media coverage. And so I think that when and now, what do you think about that? Do you think that white people need uh, spokespersons to speak up for them as whites? Well, they, I think, think they're that, speaking uh, up. Harping on, bl on black on white crime is a, is a healthy thing for our society? I think that black people, as black people, we need to be harping on uh, the black crime rate. And when we see black on white crime and vicious things taking place and a double standard, uh, we should be speaking up about it. Uh, someone should speak up about it. And I think that um, what Jared Taylor does is he points out the hypocrisy of the white liberals and how they're very comfortable in New York and probably, you know, uh, New York, Boston, around the country in their all white gatherings with their one token black. And, um, and that's true. We know it's true. And so a lot of what he has said resonates with me, but I knew that I was on to something when I heard him put together his argument because the rest of the world, they're focused on white supremacists and white nationalists. Uh, they were focused on the KKK, the neo-Nazis, um, the people that are real losers. They're never going to get a large following. But when you have someone who's an intellectual and they're making a rational case, I think it will reach a lot of young people and it has the potential to persuade the masses because what I saw uh, in the interviews and the other research that I did to supplement those interviews is that many people who don't hate black people were concerned about their own families and they felt that discrimination was wrong. White people were being discriminated against and that there was no one standing up for white people. And so I think that uh, in a perfect society, we would want to address the grievances that they might have about racial preferences uh, and one way that could have been a, one way that could have been addressed would be a move away from race-based policies to policies that were more uh, need-based and uh, need. Okay, so I, I got to ask you something, Carol. Um, <laughs> this concern, I mean, this is going to be the main argument, isn't it, against uh, uh, the new white nationalism? This is where the charge that you're an apologist for white nationalists comes from, isn't it? Which is this. Um, but the, we do, do you know, we may not be talking about the same thing we're talking about white nationalism, nationalism because I titled my book or Cambridge titled it, I don't know, because they didn't use the title that I recommended, but it's called the new white nationalism to distinguish it from old style white supremacy and the white nationalism that was violent. And so what I saw and what I, that would resonate with the wider population was the fact that these people were saying it's wrong to discriminate against uh, anyone. You know, it's against the um, civil rights laws. It's against the Constitution. Whites are being discriminated against. There's no one speaking up for whites. That was part of their argument. And then the young people point to the racial double standards, the fact that on college and university campuses, they have all of these little, um, you know, ethnic centers. Uh, but white people, as white people, you know, that if they do anything that looks like they're organizing on the base of, basis of ethnicity, even if it's a social group,
then that is uh, treated differently. But, and, but here, here's the argument. To, well, wait a minute. You also have to look at it. Like one reason I got this right in that book is that whites are becoming a minority in the United States, and I expected them to act like other racial and ethnic minority groups. And so that's what we see. Okay, no, here, here, let me make uh, this counter argument because I hear you. Okay. And, and I'm not unsympathetic to what you're saying personally. I've said similar things myself. How are you going to expect to have a constant political conversation that's racialized and white people are not going to have a race and an interest in that conversation? How, that, that's unreasonable. It's unreasonable as a behavioral claim to expect that they are going to sit by unaware of being white while you constantly frame everything that's happening in society in terms of being black or being of color. So I, I take that point, but here's, here's the counter argument that I can imagine somebody All trying right. to make, which is this, which is history is not neutral here. In other words, we live in the midst at the uh, early part of the 21st century, we live amidst the consequences of a very long train of events and they are not neutral with respect to whiteness. The evocation of whiteness, of white nationalism, of white identity is a qualitatively different and more dangerous phenomenon. You can expect that the people underneath the oppressive consequences of history will identify as victims of it. But to have the oppressors identify and to define themselves as victim, even as the structures of power continue to allow them to hold people back, Come on, racial slavery? You're gonna compare affirmative, I'm not saying you personally. What a person of this uh, inclination is gonna compare the affront to white people of affirmative action in the 21st century to the affront to black people of the whole uh, long history of uh, racial domination. So, so you're gonna let a genie out of the bottle here. If you allow that equation, that's a kind of uh, moral equivalency. If you allow that equation to, to pass, uh, you're letting a genie out of the bottle here, and it can only come back to uh, uh, the uh, to hurt uh, people of color. Well, I mean, there's so much that you've said there, and and then I guess I put on my Christian hat now, and that has to do with I believe in God's providence, and you and I both, I guess you may know your ancestry, but if we do one of those DNA tests, we have plenty of. Caucasian, you know, all of this sure. blood in our cells. And um, you go back to the debate between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, and we know who won that debate, but the principles and values that Booker T. Washington and many Blacks, you know, throughout the generations espouse, put them on a better path than we are on today. And I think with white people becoming a minority throughout the country, and America being the kind of nation it is, that we're better off, and as my book argues, moving away from identity politics towards the American national identity. And in that book, The New White Nationalism, I talk about white interests and white consciousness being the next phase of identity, conscious, identity politics in America. So that was one of the things in 2002 uh, I got right, and I felt like the solution involved white people and black people, that white people um, and black people had certain things they had to do, and part of it was to move away from the identity politics and the multiculturalism and to start looking in terms of what benefits America as a whole. How do you think that's going? I don't think we're there yet. And I think we're making serious mistakes. I think this diversity, inclusion, industry that's affecting corporations, as well as colleges and universities and recent decisions by the UC California system to move away from testing. I think that all of that is to the detriment of black people and that uh, we're not doing very well at all. I think that too much, um, uh, power has been um, uh, given to those voices of division. And I think that if America is to stand strong and if our people are to be you know, able to compete in the world, we have to move away from the identity politics that is very destructive. Well, and I gotta ask you. One, yeah. one more thing. 
I think right now that um, we are at a period of time where you see a lot of reverse discrimination against whites. The things that people are able to do to white young people, what professors say to them in the classroom, what they do to, to them during orientation. If you're a Christian, if you're white, especially a white male, they would not tolerate that against any other group. I mean, and, and like, for example, give me they're an example. all my children. They all give, my children. Give me an example of what you're talking about in terms of the abuse of white males in an orientation program and of Christians. Well, I can tell you that uh, what I have uh, experienced is that that orientation week or that orientation process is like a cultural shock. And that part of what they try to do, you know, if it's a child that comes from a Christian home, they try to shock them with the institutional values that will be as progressive as they can be. And if you are white, you're privileged, no matter if you came from Appalachia and your parent, you come from three generations of coal miners and maids and waitresses, you're privileged because of the color of your skin. You are an oppressor. You're responsible for everything bad that's happened in the world. You told yeah. that and they try to shame you because of the color of your skin or the fact that you believe in God, we would not allow that to happen to any other group. And I think it's wrong. I think okay. to stand let, up let, to it. I got to ask you this. So uh, one of the issues is going to be the moral status of homosexuality. It's going to be gay marriage. It's going to be gay adoption. Uh, the line, the progressive line, the accepted moral judgment is that to be um, you know, skeptical about the moral status of homosexuality or hostile to it uh, as a moral position based on your faith is bigotry against homosexuals and it would have no place in almost any of these academic venues that I can imagine. What do you say to that? I can tell you that what a lot of schools do for orientation is they get the most flamboyant, flamboyant gay person they can find and they put that person out front and they tell you know they make it very clear that if you come from a background where you believe you know that homosexuality is a sin you and your values are not welcome here so they do all of that um i think because they want the gay student to feel safe and valued in the environment and in the process they have to destroy uh, uh students that don't share those beliefs or intimidate them to the point that they live in fear and it seems to me that we can coexist. And I don't know any Christians in any churches that I've ever attended that hate gays uh, or wish them ill will. But I believe that uh, we can't say that on the other side. And then from my own experiences, like I took early retirement from Vanderbilt. I'm not at liberty to go into details about all of uh, the factors that went into that. But I can tell you that I watched the university become more and more progressive and by university i mean universities in america and i would and say you don't that, mean that as a compliment either <laughs> no because i don't think they are marketplaces of ideas anymore and that they don't expose the students to critical thinking skills that they have become factories for indoctrination and so i don't believe our children are being uh, well educated uh and the travesty is the amount of money that parents are paying to send their children there, if their children come from traditional homes with traditional values, they're sending them into an unsafe place where every effort will be made to destroy those children, everything they believe, and turn them into something else. And um, so I think that that is to the detriment. And you look at me like I'm a high school dropout, first generation you know, college student, uh, while I was at the community uh, college, I started as a work study student, ended up being hired for a full time job nights and weekends, worked full time while I was at Roanoke College, graduated magna cum laude, working a full time job, bringing my children in at night um, because I worked in the library and so they could sit at a table while I was working. I've done all that, became a successful professor and the left has done everything possible to destroy me and to keep me away from young people. They don't want me to share the secrets of success that made it possible for me to overcome my poverty. Uh, they don't want that to be known. I'm a threat. I have nothing of value because I am um, a person who was never big in, into the feminist movement. And then because I don't, um, 
share the views of liberal blacks, I have no value to the world. Well, you have a great deal of value, Carol Swain. I'll certainly say that. And I've got some more things that I want to discuss with you, so I'm not in a hurry to end this conversation. You remind me, however, did you see this recent, uh, the recently released film about Justice Clarence Thomas, uh, Created Equal? Uh, you remind me uh, in more than a small degree of the uh, uh, story of Clarence Thomas. It's not a very dissimilar story. You got, uh, Carol, you all are both from the Southeast of the United States. You both came up poor. You're both extraordinary African-American conservative people. Clarence Thomas is not an academic, but he is the longest serving justice of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, you have a very distinguished academic career. I can't get over these two blockbuster books. Now, two blockbuster books, uh, Black Faces, Black Interests, and now The New White Nationalism. And I want to ask you this. Um, do you think we are winning or losing? By we, I mean those African-American intellectuals like you and me, uh, who cut across the grain, we're different, we don't believe the same things in every regard, but there are some similarities in who cut across the grain of thinking that is popular amongst African-American elites. Do you think we're losing or we're winning? I think that uh, the answer can be found in uh, Joe Biden's comment that you ain't black, you know, if you don't support him, that uh, they have figured out a way, the progressives that run you know, large parts of the world to take people like us who are conservative and who are different and black and say that we don't can't, you know, that we're just like unicorns. So in, in that so sense- So we're losing. Well, I don't know that if we're losing, we're losing alongside a lot of other conservatives. And when you talk about my books, um, like the two books that I wrote, you know, for academics, um, I, I also wrote in 2011 a book, Black Faces, Black Interest, not Black Faces, Black Interest, uh, <laughs> Be the People, A Call to Reclaim America's Faith and Promise. And uh, in that book, you know, I, I don't know that, it. Forgive me. I don't know that book. I think that book is very important. And then um, a couple of years ago, I co-authored a book with uh, a man that had been a pastor abduction, how liberalism steals the hearts and minds of our children to inform parents about some of the things that have taken place, you know, in public and private schools, that's all about uh, stripping our children of the values we put in them and instilling their own values. And so all of these things are taking place. The American people, whether they are white or black, are not as informed as they should be. And when it comes to black people like us, and where we stand, I think that it is very important for us to be self-sacrificial. And my faith uh, enables me, you know, to stand strong. Um, and I believe, you know, that God knows us before we are born. He orders our footsteps. Uh, I worked in nursing homes before I started college. I wanted to, to go to nursing school and I could have become a nurse. I didn't get admitted to nursing school, and I believe that's because God had a different path for me. And I believe that my story is not about me. It's much bigger than me. It's meant to be shared just like your story, and that we have an obligation to share our knowledge, you know, to the world. And it's not easy, you know, to be a Black conservative, but I feel, you know, very blessed. In a way, I feel chosen. I feel like I'm on a mission and it doesn't matter, you know, what the world does to me. I don't believe that, you know, that my fate is in human hands. I got to ask you about Donald J. Trump. You serve on the National Advisory Board of Black Voices for Trump, if I'm not mistaken. You are an open, out of the closet, overt and, <laughs> and unreconstructed Trump supporter. Can you please explain yourself to the rest of America? Well, the most important thing for me to explain is that I've spent my life avoiding black stuff. Like I just wanted to be a political scientist. I wanted to be the best <laughs> political scientist me. I could be. Uh, and I was not active in the black student union. Bless you. Excuse me. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. I was not active in the black student unions. I was not active in black things. I didn't want to be a black something. I just wanted to be me. And so when black voices uh, for Trump approached me, 
it was not an easy um, decision to affiliate with something that was exclusively black. Uh, but I realized that whether it's the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, that you have to fit in a box. And so I even had someone tell me, which box do you fit in? Do you want to be in the religious box? You know, because I'm a person of strong faith, I could get, be in the religious box. Well, you know, God didn't call me to be exclusively in the religious box. But being a part of Black Voices for Trump, I made that decision because I thought that was the most effective way to help him win re-election. I believe that he is important for America, that he's done tremendous things for Blacks, and that the country was on the right uh, trajectory before the coronavirus and the hysteria around it. And I believe that keeping the coronavirus and the fear and all of these lockdowns and restrictions that has gone beyond trying to keep people safe, that it's all politically motivated now. The Democrats see an opportunity to get everything they ever wanted on their socialist wish list uh, by keeping the country shut down. And that that's a part of what's going on. So I am a proud member of uh, Black Voices for Trump. And I was also, up until, up until recently, the Black Outreach Director for the Mighty American Strike Force. And that's a group that sends out volunteers to battle, battleground states. Uh, I'm moving into the position of outreach for college students, and I'm on that steering committee. But as long as the world is kind of organized around race, I felt like, and this was a prayerful decision, that I can do more by being on Black Voices, being a part of Black Voices for Trump, and being a part of outreach to Blacks than I can by maintaining my individuality. Okay, there's you you, you said a whole lot right there. Uh, <laughs> there's the coronavirus piece, which I want to set to the side for the moment. Uh, I want to talk about the Trump piece. Um, a lot of people are scratching their heads. In the spirit of Joe Biden, they're saying to themselves, have you lost your mind? Uh, you can't tell the difference between uh, a racist, and that's Donald Trump, Donald Trump of Charlottesville fame, John Donald Trump of uh, Central Park uh, Five fame, Donald Trump the racist. I mean, we know he's a racist from the travel ban. We know he's a racist from his uh, antipathy to uh, 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 migrants. Uh, come on, man, as uh, Joe Biden would say, Donald Trump's a racist. So I want you to deal with that. Um, and I, I want you to talk about uh, what is it about Trump's policies that appeal to you? I mean, specifically building up the military, building the wall, cutting off the uh, dealings with NATO. Uh, uh, what What is it, uh, you know, what is in the interest of Black people in the Trump movement? Well, I mean, there are a lot of things that you've asked me there, and I can tell you that I am the expert on white nationalism. And there have been some books written after mine that didn't cite my work. And so you might, there might be a way that you can become an expert on white nationalism and skip that Cambridge Press book. But I am the expert on white nationalism and Donald Trump is not a white nationalist, nor are the overwhelming majority of his white supporters. And like, um, when you're running for office, you can't control you know, who's gonna support you. They look at the alternatives. A lot of us, didn't want to vote for Hillary Clinton. And um, so the first thing, the label that they've tried to apply to him as being a white supremacist and white nationalist, there's no evidence for that. And when you look at Charlottesville and how the president handled it, um, I guess he made a statement that there were bad people on both sides and that was used to say- Good people. He said there were good people on both sides. Okay, <laughs> whatever you say. <said>. Okay, <laughs> good people on both sides. Well, I understand you know, what he meant and that was used against him. First of all, the group that was protesting, I believe they were, pro part of what they were protesting was the pulling down of monuments, you know, to that were related to the Civil War. And so that was a big issue during that time. The main group had a permit to be there. There were all these other groups that showed up, you know, maybe Black Lives Matter, Antifa, all of those groups, and they incited uh, violence. And even the guy that, uh, you know, drove the car into the uh, crowd 
and we haven't heard a lot of information about him and his trial, but some of what did come out was that someone had uh, pointed a gun towards him and the driver was surrounded by crowds and he panicked. And so you cannot go by anything that the media reports. Everything has more detail than what we get from the media. And I think with Charlottesville, you did have bad people on both sides. We No one that has studied Antifa would call them good people. And they were not there for the right motivation. And we know with Black Lives Matter uh, that they have taken um, a true statement. Of course, Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, as a fact, like all lives matter, but this organization has had a very Marxist agenda and they have incited violence. And, uh, and the groups that were there in Charlottesville, some of them were there, you know, to make trouble. And that's a fact. And so I don't think it's fair to say that, you know, the president is a white nationalist because these people showed up. And what really bothers me about President Trump and his election is the fact that we know that the resistance to him started before he was uh, inaugurated. It started the day after he was elected. And I've never seen anything like it. These four years, the president has been attacked from every side yet he's made tremendous progress. And what he was trying to do with immigration is something that should have been done a long time ago. Uh, one of my books, uh, it's an edited book, Cambridge Press, Debating Immigration. You know, it looks at all sides, these books, there's two of them, looks, looks at all sides of the immigration issue. It's been clear that for, you know, more than 20, 25 years, something needed to be done about immigration. Neither political party was willing to take action and so what candidate uh, Trump and President Trump was trying to do were things that needed to be done. And uh, when he put on the travel ban involving uh, Islam, that needed to be done. When he stopped flights from China, that needed to be done. And so I think the evidence of uh, Donald Trump being a racist is very weak. And if you look at um, the support he's given, sure. well, well, let me get to that. The support he's given Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and many black individuals to help them get their businesses started over the years. He was never labeled as a racist until he became a Republican nominee. And then all of a sudden, everything that he had done good involving race, that was forgotten. If you are Republican and you're white, you're automatically considered a racist. And if you are Republican and you're black, you're just an Uncle Tom. And when you talk about the Central Park uh, Five, or you talk about uh, the policy he, he or his father may have had in place when it came to uh, renting apartments or Which homes. Which is a separate thing, but okay. I would say that you have to look at the era. During that time with the Central Park Five, everyone thought they knew the story of what happened. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember just how horrific that attack was. And so yeah. uh, I think that if you look at what other leaders and other people were saying at the same time, uh, that he, what, whatever he did, whether it was putting out an ad or, 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 or financing, you know, part of the yeah. case, what did he do? Uh, he, he took out an ad. I don't know all the details in which he uh, said, that in effect, bring back the death penalty to the horror of crime in our time, of which the Central Park Five were exemplary. Uh, but I may not have all the details on that right. But you're right. Hillary Clinton was talking about super predators at the same at roughly the same time and everybody was concerned about what was going on in new york city in the late 80s and early 90s so i take that point but i gotta say i gotta say a couple of things one is i really appreciate you coming on the glenn show and talking about this stuff i really think people need to hear from you and uh, others of similar ilk they don't even know you exist carol uh and that's significant i am not endorsing everything you're saying i want to put that on the record i'm not Countering that's everything. You're not a, that's because I'm not you're countering not. everything you're saying either. I'm not against it or for it. I think you need to be heard. That's that's all I want to well, say. Well, yeah. I speak for myself. <laughs> well, I can tell you that uh, it seems like ever since I was born, people have tried to silence me. And during the time I was at Princeton, the early years, I was painfully shy. And after I had my born again Christian conversion experience in 1999. It's like God removed my shyness and he impressed on me that he had given me a message bigger than me. And as long as I focused on the message, I could speak. And when I didn't speak, it was always because I was fearful. People would laugh at me because of my accent. 
I would mispronounce a word. I would you know, make a grammatical mistake. All of that kept me silent. I reached a point, I don't care. I'm gonna speak. I'm gonna do what I think is best for the country as a whole. Well, God bless you in that. I, I gotta ask you something though. This is still on Donald Trump. He's a boob. He's bumbling. He's inarticulate. Uh, he's uh, he's narcissistic. He's uh, unfit for the position. You've heard of the never Trumpers, right? I mean, you can't get away from them. They're I know everywhere. some of them. Uh, he's a danger to the Republic. Uh, he is an embarrassment to the Republican Party. Mitch McConnell should be ashamed of himself. Jack Kemp, not Jack Kemp, uh, the guy in Wisconsin. Paul Ryan should have been ashamed of himself for collaborating with this guy. Um, he doesn't read books. He's ignorant. He watches too much television. He tweets while sitting on the toilet. Uh, come on. Come on, man. This is this is Donald Trump, the clown show. This is P.T. Barnum as president of the United States. What do you have to say to that? I love Donald Trump. <laughs> the first time I met Donald Trump, and that was last October. I met him in person. And when I went to shake his hand, he said, I've seen you before. You do a great job. <laughs> <laughs> so he charmed your socks off. No, but even before that, uh, I like um, the fact that he's real and, um, and he's unscripted. And in a lot of ways, I am real and I'm unscripted and I'm transparent. And I value that better than, more than I value someone that's slick and polished and they always get it right and they know the right thing to say. And I don't believe in speech codes or censorship. Uh, and you should have Jared Taylor on your show. I think people should be allowed to speak and that we make a mistake because I would much rather know uh, what a person is thinking than have them conceal who they really are. They can you do know what would happen if I had Jared Taylor on my show? Do you know what would happen? There would be. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if my colleagues at bloggingheads.tv would want to associate with me anymore. Uh, I think there would be a firestorm of protest. My reputation as an academic economist would be damaged. My standing with my colleagues and students here at Brown would be placed in jeopardy. I would be accused of aiding and abetting white supremacy, Carol. I mean, now courage is one thing, but suicide is another. Well, let me tell you that. Uh, during the early days, right after my book was published, and I wanted people to see the real face of the new white nationalism, that it was not the guy with the beer, beer gut and the missing teeth that you see on TV, that's the Klansman. That, it, that, that I wanted them to see this polished gentleman, you know, educated at Yale, and I brought him to Vanderbilt to debate a civil rights activist. So it was a debate. And my students, uh, they were taking a course on hate groups in America that I was teaching. And they came away with the impression that Jared Taylor really won the debate because the civil rights activists just threw out epithets. I think you would be an excellent person to debate Jared Taylor. So maybe it's not going to be on your show, but uh, I think his ideas are worthy of being debated. Plus, I also believe that he is a person that can change his mind. I don't think he's so wedded uh, to his positions that he's unredeemable. And so as a Christian, uh, Jerry Taylor is someone that I spent years praying for. And when I see him, I speak to him. I warmly greet him. I don't hate him. I don't hate people like him. I try to understand where they're coming from. And so that's how I see it. Okay, Carol, I'm going to call it a, a conversation here. We've been talking for an hour or so. Glenn Lowry at The Glenn Show with Carol Swain, retired professor of politics and law from Vanderbilt University, former professor at Princeton University, author of many books, a former mayoral candidate in Nashville, Tennessee, a born again Christian and evangelist, uh, and a uh, black American conservative uh, and a wonderful human being. I'm glad we were able to share some time together, Carol. Well, thank you, Glenn, and I really appreciate having you in my life and um, and just, you know, all of us working together can only bring good to this nation. All right. Uh, that is a wrap, Carol. <laughs>